We're talking about self-remembering again. Unless you believe in something higher, you cannot remember yourself. And one of the problems people seem to have in the work is, or at least one of the problems you've seemed to have had, is you don't seem to be able to reconcile your religion, your faith, your spiritual system with the fourth way system, where it seems to be difficult to reconcile the two. Like you can have one or the other, but you can't have both. And it seems to have hobbled a lot of you, some more than others. That's a shame, really, because Gurdjieff was a very spiritual man, and his system is a very spiritual system. Now, it's true that it has become divorced from the spiritual aspect. It's become divorced from the spiritual side through ritual and over time. As people get further and further away from Gurdjieff, they get further and further away from the heart of the system. The heart of the system really is spiritual because in the beginning, it is so top-heavy with intellectual knowledge that you have to get. You've got to get the language down. You've got to get the cosmos thing down. You've got to get the Enneagram. You've got to get the ray of creation. You, there are a lot of things you have to get down in order to move comfortably in this system. There's a lot of knowledge you have to get. When that happens, people get top-heavy intellectually and they lose their balance. Well, it's a natural thing to lose your balance. But it's unnatural to keep your balance gone. It's not unnatural, really, in, the, in a world sense, in an ordinary sense. It's not unnatural at all. But in a work sense, it's very unnatural. In a work sense, you're supposed to be moving toward being man number four, which is balanced man. Well, you're not moving toward being man number four, which is balanced man, if you're not developing spiritually as well as intellectually, emotionally, and physically. We use all three paths. The physical path is a very real path. It's a path that you have been unwilling to take to this point, other than you'll sit in meditation. You will not tolerate other physical disciplines. If I press too hard, then I end up with a lot of resistance and a lot of resentment. What can I say? That just tells me that that's an area that you really need work in, but you just don't want to work there. You're too resistant and you're too resentful about it, so you refuse to go down that path. It's like, no, I won't go. Like, okay, then you won't go anywhere then. You can only go so far on this path, hopping on one leg. This work walks on two legs. You've got to go forward on two legs. So you've got to be moving in whatever area we're moving in at the moment. And at the moment, we're trying to move in a spiritual direction. And I think you'll find that wherever you're holding back, that's going to hinder this part of the, the movement. Whatever it is you've decided, I'm not going there, we're not talking about that, we're not doing that. That's the area that you have shut off. The problem is, it's just like building a wall around yourself to protect yourself from that mean person or that mean person. You don't end up just protecting yourself from that mean person or that mean person. You end up protecting yourself from all of life, from everyone. You shut everyone out. When you determine there's an area in your life that you're not going to deal with, that you're not going to allow light in, that you're not going to open up in, then in that area, you build a wall. That wall isn't just for that area, just like shutting one person out doesn't just shut one person out, it shuts them all out. Saying no to this area is really saying no to all the areas. It's saying, no, the work can come this far and no further. Because you see, it's not really a matter of a wall and this area. What it's really a matter of, this one thing and only one thing, my right to myself. I have a right to myself. This is where I take my stand. You will not come past here. This is where your rights end. These are where my rights begin. I have a right to myself. You can't come past here. That's the end. That's where you stop your growth, right there. That's the point. It may be a very small thing. It's still enough to stop your growth. That's up to you. If you find yourself struggling and struggling inordinately and suffering inordinately, there's probably a good reason for that. And the good reason is probably you have determined through your own willfulness that there is some area that you're not going to grow in and you will suffer. And it'll be useless, unnecessary suffering until you decide to sacrifice it. So unless you believe in something higher, you can't remember yourself. So you've got to believe that there's something higher than you. If you can't believe that there's something higher than you, then this is it. This is it right here. This is it. We live, we die. That's it. You're dead. You're dead. You go to the grave. The worms eat you. That's the end of it. You're unconscious. You're unconscious. You know nothing. You cease to exist. If that's the way it is, then you cannot remember yourself. There's nothing to remember. Certain emotional feeling is always connected with self-remembering. Self-remembering cannot be done in cold blood. You can't just, in cold blood, remember yourself. There's a certain emotional feeling about it. And you've got to learn to develop a taste for this emotional feeling. You've got to learn to perceive it. You've got to learn to sense it so that you can hone in on it, so that you can move toward it. We must get into a certain state which self-observation doesn't require. You can observe yourself without remembering yourself. We got something there, we connected something there, because some people shook their head. Yeah, okay, so they obviously can tell that there is a difference between self-observation and self-remembering. This is a good thing. Though both of these actions finally meet, 
Self-remembering and self-observation will finally meet, but they don't always meet in the beginning. In the beginning, self-remembering is much more difficult than self-observation. Self-remembering brings us under new influences that we can't otherwise reach. You've got to see that in order to change, in order for you to change your thoughts and your feelings, you are going to have to come under new influences. Now the problem is that you're resisting those new influences. How are you resisting those new influences? Yes? By my identification. With? With the past, with my own ideas. Yeah. We resist new influences through our identification with how we are, how things are right now. This is how things are. Mm -hmm. This is what I like. This is what I want. This is what I've always done. This is what I will always do because I like doing this. And you don't have any right to tell me not to do this, which of course is entirely true. I have no right to tell you anything. But I didn't really come here to tell you anything. You came here to have me tell you something. And when you forget that, you put yourself in a very precarious position. You think that I'm here because I've got something that somehow will complete me if I tell you. And that's not the case at all. The case is that you want to complete something about yourself and I have something that will help you to get there. We need to keep that in perspective. And when we lose perspective on that, we then turn this whole relationship upside down so that you're the teacher and I'm just some guy, which is fine. If that's what you want, then you don't need to be here. You need to be somewhere else because I'm not looking for you as a teacher. I have a teacher. And so I pay very close, very strict attention to my teacher and I attempt to do whatever my teacher says to do. We all can say the same thing. But what's the difference? Is there a difference? You do it and I don't. I don't know if I do it or not. But... And you can't really say either. All you can say is whether or not you actually do it or whether or not you just imagine you do it. But in order to do that, you'd have to be sincere and you'd have to observe yourself sincerely, objectively. And sometimes you can do that and sometimes you can't. And you're going to have to remember your highest moments because the thing is, is you don't spend much time there. You spend most of your life in your ordinary state. And unless you remember your higher moments, you're not going anywhere in this work, which is what this talk is about. Self-remembering, remembering your higher moments, remembering your higher states of consciousness, remembering the best that you have ever been and living up to that, not mechanically living down to your ordinary states. There's a state of wonder versus a state of taking everything for granted. And you begin to notice there's a different smell and a different taste to the world when you have that sense of wonder. I look at the flowers, the bougainvillea flowers, and I'm always amazed by the color. And I'm always amazed by the paper thinness of the flower. That something so thin and delicate can be so vibrant and hardy. It's an odd thing to me. Whereas a rose petal is thick, has a lot of substance, a lot of moisture to it. But it seems like a bougainvillea flower petal doesn't have that at all. You can see through it, whereas you can't really see through a rose petal. They're hardy. But the bougainvillea, this vibrant, almost translucent thing. And there's a sense of wonder that goes with that. Or there's the other sense of, oh man, the bougainvillea needs to be cut. You see the difference? One is you're more conscious. The other one is you're taking things in your ordinary state, in your ordinary way. Take everything for granted. We look at the leaves and we go, yeah, we got to cut that. All this work. Now we've got to cut all this stuff. Then we got to pay somebody to haul it away. That's our ordinary state. That's taking everything for granted. Self-remembering happens when we're aware of the miraculous. When you look at a tree and you think about what it is and how it got there, that it's a living, growing being, that it has something about its nature, its treeness, that separates it from the telephone pole that is right next to it that was a living, growing being and now is not. When you can think about for a moment that you see through your eyes, and you do not know how. The miracle of sight that we take for granted darn near every minute of every day. In order to remember yourself, you've got to be able to get yourself into that other state where you're not taking things for granted. The miraculous is something that fills you with wonder. You can see we don't spend much time there. Remember that you're in the work. Remember what that means. Take everything in a different way. Every time you come over to my house, you have an opportunity to take everything in a different way. And not every time you come over to my house do you take that opportunity. That's a mistake. You need to take that opportunity. You come over to our house and it's like, well, I'm going to go see this guy. Great. You can go next door and see some guy. If that's all you're going to do, don't come over to my house. That's all. Just don't bother. Don't do me any favors. When you come there, come expecting something. Come expecting to wake up some more. Come expecting to deal with areas that you don't want to deal with, but that you do want to deal with. So see the dichotomy in yourself. 
see that there's something doesn't want to deal with it, but see that there's something does want to deal with it. And then choose which eyes you're going to go with. Are you going to go with the ordinary eyes? No, I don't want to deal with that. I'm so sick of that. I'm not going to have him. No, he's just some guy. He doesn't know everything. Blah, blah, blah. You're going to go with those eyes? Those are not good eyes. You're going to go with the bad eyes? Or let's say you choose not to go with the bad eyes. Let's say you just choose to believe them. Where are you then? Are you in a better place or a worse place? Are you in a better place? Better place than going with them? I don't agree. I think you'd be better off going with them. If you're going to believe in them, you may as well go with them. At least that will smack you hard in the face. Sooner or later, that will smack you. But if you just believe in them, you don't go with them. That's so much more insidious. Can you see how that's more insidious? It undermines you. It eats away like a cancer until eventually you'll collapse. Your whole relationship will collapse. So remember you're in the work. Remember what it means. Take everything in a different way. The work must stand between us and life. You've got to have this work stand between you and life. Life. You two, in your wrangling, you don't have the work standing between you and life. You are standing toe to toe, hammering on each other. And I'm asking you to put the work in the middle and for neither one of you to do anything that is not filtered through the work. And you're not doing that. And you're not doing that because you've insisted on having your way. You've insisted on your rights. I have a right to express myself. I have a right to my own opinion. I have a right to say what I want to say, just like everybody else. I have a right to tell you what's wrong with you as I see it. That's my job. I have a right to tell you what you need to change as I see it. That's my job. I never gave anybody those jobs. Those jobs are jobs you took by yourself. I never gave you those jobs. The job I have given you is to have the work between you two so that when you do what you're doing, the work is what determines everything that goes between you. Nothing goes between you without the work. That's the job that I gave you. I told you it was a difficult job. I asked you, are you going to be able to do this? Are you willing to do this? Are you willing to do the job that I've asked you to do? And you both agreed. And at every time I see that you're not doing it, I check and I say, okay, so I know I've asked you to do a lot. Are you still willing to do it? And you keep saying yes, but you keep not putting the work in there. What I want to know is, what is it going to take for you to start to put the work in there? Well, what it's going to take is some self-remembering. You're going to have to remember, this is not just some ordinary task I've given you. I'm not just some ordinary person giving you some ordinary task. I'm not your boss at work. I'm not your next door neighbor. It's not like that. This is not how our life is. That's not who I am in your life. If that's who I am in your life, you need to leave. You don't belong here. If that's who you're going to make me in your life, then go away. You don't belong here. There's nothing for you here. There's just some idiot standing up here, some goofy looking idiot. I mean, look at this, standing up here, blabbing about something that's meaningless, means nothing. It's senseless. Your time would be much better spent at a Padres game. What season is this? Is there some kind of sport thing going this time of year? With baseball? So that's Padres, right? You'd be better off at a Padres game. At least you could have some fun. This doesn't look like much fun for you. If you think that nature, that matter, created itself, you can't remember yourself. Only through a feeling of something higher can you separate from something lower. You think that all this just happened. You think nature created itself, matter created itself. You're not going to remember yourself because there's no higher, there's no lower. There's only this. You got to believe that there's something higher in order to separate from something lower or else there's no point. If nature created itself, if matter created itself, then there's no possibility for you other than to go the way of matter, to go the way of nature, to go the way of all flesh. That's it. Then it's over. Great. That If that's the truth, I want to know that because then life suddenly becomes very easy. They go, oh, great. That's it. Then there's nothing to struggle for. It's all set. But unfortunately, you don't believe that. But you act as if you do. And that's the really weird thing. You don't believe that at all. You really do believe in something higher, but you act just the opposite. You act as if, oh, it all doesn't matter, but it does matter. Everything you do matters. Everything you do matters. Everything you think matters. Everything you feel matters. Everything matters. The test comes when we can distinguish between more awake and more asleep. In the beginning, you don't know more awake from more asleep. So there's nothing can happen. There's no testing can be done. But when you start to be able to distinguish between more asleep and more awake, that's when it really hits the fan. That's when things get tough. When you can distinguish between when you're more awake and more asleep, you have a little bit of choice. And then you find yourself making bad choices. And you're accountable for those bad choices because you know the difference between being a little more awake and a little more asleep. And then you begin to suffer. But it's not a good kind of suffering. It's a useless, unnecessary suffering because you're making the bad choices. It's only when you choose to be more awake and to suffer being more awake, to sacrifice being more awake, to sacrifice in your awakeness, in your awakened state, to say, okay, I know better, but I want to act worse, but I'm going to sacrifice what I want. Everything inside of you is going to try and justify not doing that, going to try and justify the other way, everything. Then you have a choice and that's tough. That's when the real test begins because that's where the real choice is and that's where the real test is. The test isn't in what you do. The test is in what you believe. 
the eyes that you choose to believe and go with. That is where the test is. If you think the test is in what you say, you've missed it. You've missed it by a wide margin. That's not where the test is. And that's what you've been thinking. And how I know that is, that's how you've been acting. And we act from what we think and believe. A man speaks out of the fullness of his heart, well, he acts the same way. And that's the way you've been acting. So it tells me that you're missing this crucial point. I don't talk to you to hear what you like or what you want. I'm not interested in that. We all have likes and dislikes, wants and don't wants. We've all got that. So what? This is the work. This is not life. This is the work. You have one of the greatest honors that a human being can have. You are in the work. You are on the path to remembering yourself. You are on the path to awakening. You are on the path to becoming what you could be, to leaving this ordinary crap behind and becoming something beyond anything that you can imagine in your current state, liberated beyond anything that you can even imagine. And you're treating it as if it's just some group of ideas that somebody thought up. And it's not like that at all. Either this work comes from the conscious circle of humanity or we're the biggest fools that have ever existed. Now, which is it? You need to choose and you need to get with it. I have a lot more respect for the people who've left than for the people who waffle. At least they've chosen. This is stupid. You stink. I'm leaving. Great. Have a great life. It's your life. Go have a great life. I'm not telling you to leave. I'm telling you to work. If you can't tell the difference, <laughs> then you're not here anyway. Get here. To so say I'm not telling you to leave, I'm saying, look, if you're not here, then get here. Your butt's in the chair. But where are you? No affection, no desire, no work. That's how it goes. You have no affection for this. You have no desire for this. You aren't going to work. You won't have an affection for this until you can see what it can do for you. And you won't see what it can do for you until you see what kind of a specimen you actually are. The thing is, we get glimpses of what kind of a specimen we actually are. And it's usually like, oh, we recoil in horror. But the thing is, we've got to learn to embrace that because it's where we are. It's who we are. It's where we are. It's not a very pretty picture, but it is where we are. And unless we can embrace it, can you see that we can't be on it? You've got to be able to embrace it. You've got to stop judging it and just embrace it. This is okay. This is who I am. It's not so great, but it's who I am and it's where I start. And only from here can I move forward. I can't move forward from anywhere else. As I said, we can go with bad eyes anytime, or we can gradually learn not to surrender to their power. See, the thing with bad eyes is they've got tremendous power. They've got a lot more power than the work has right now. It's because your affection for bad eyes is so great. You love them. You cannot live without them. You go after them. If they don't come around for a while, you go stir it up and try and get them up. Think about it. If you're not going with bad eyes for a while, <laughs> you go and try and find some so that you can get back in their company because you feel so comfortable there. You're nuts because when you do that, you're expressing negative emotion. Do you understand that? Yeah. And the work definition of insanity is expressing negative emotions. Can anyone tell me why that's insane? Good. Then I'll tell you. Why is it insane to express negative emotion? Well, because they don't fix anything. You have no power to do anything, to change anything. You can't change anything. You can't make anything happen. You can't do anything. Let's take an example that just about all of us, all of the, the marginally sane or the marginally insane, whichever, will agree with. Do you realize that there is a war going on now in Iraq? Do you know there's nothing you can do about that? I mean, oh, well, I can pray for peace. Yeah, that's doing nothing. That will not affect what's happening in Iraq at all. It may affect your state of consciousness. It may affect your state of being. If you can raise yourself up, if you can lift yourself up into a place where you acknowledge that there is something higher than you and you begin to remember yourself and you begin to remember your work aim, then it lifts you up. But it's really not going to do much for Iraq. It would take a lot of that lifting ourselves up for anything to change in Iraq. Does that mean it can't change? Well, I don't know. But really, that's not our point, is it? We're not here to philosophize. We're here to practically apply these work teachings and experiment in our own life with our own bodies and our own minds and our own emotions and find what works and what doesn't work. That's why we're here. And we could waste an enormous amount of time theorizing and philosophizing about something else. But we can't verify it. But we can verify this. We can verify that I can raise my state of consciousness by praying for someone else or by thinking about it in a higher way, by putting myself under better influences, by going with better eyes. I can change my level of being. This feeling of choice is where self-remembering begins. We can choose between eyes. It's really lifting oneself above oneself. And that's what has to happen for us. We've got to lift ourselves above ourselves. So we've got to lift ourselves above our ordinary level of being.
Our ordinary level of being is we react to this in the same way every time, or nine out of ten times. And there'll be one person who says, well, I didn't react that one time that way, so I've changed, therefore I'm different. Well, okay, fine. If that's what you want to believe, there's nothing I can do about your imagination. You have to handle that. You have to handle your imagination. If you're going to live in your imagination, you're not going to go very far in this work. You must give that up. One of the things you've got to sacrifice, not just your negative imagination. We don't think it's negative to think how wonderful we are. We think that's a very positive thing. But the results are that they keep you from actually seeing where you are, which means they keep you from actually being able to move from where you are, which means you are in prison. So call it whatever you want. I'm not here to argue points. I'm here to teach you the system. I'm here to encourage you to apply it. That's it. The subject of this work is oneself. Theory won't cut it. I don't care about the theory. I'm not interested in the theory. The subject of this work is you. You are the subject of this work. I am the subject of this work. I am the subject of my work. You are the subject of your work. Mere knowledge is useless in and of itself. In fact, it can be dangerous. It's not enough to have knowledge. You've got to have more than knowledge. All that is then is theory or philosophy. You've got to have more. You've got to be able to put it to work. You've got to be able to use it. You've got to be able to apply it to yourself in a sincere, objective way. And only when you can do that can you ever begin to expect to make any kind of experiments that you can verify anything. You have to take a scientific approach to this. Can you see that? It has to be a scientific approach. It has to be very objective, very scientific. We'll see what we get. I don't know what we'll get. Oh, but we have to get this. <laughs> That's all belief. Belief is okay. Faith is better. Faith that something higher exists is a good thing. Faith that that something higher is going to magically drag you up there is imagination, not faith at all. It's mechanical faith. There's mechanical faith and there's conscious faith. There's mechanical belief, there's conscious belief. Why is it that we think things should always go right and then we're upset when they don't? <laughs> what are you smiling about? How much imagination, imagination, and believing our own imagination. Do you know what you're smiling about? You had a moment of awareness. You had a moment where you looked and went, well, that's right. I always think everything is going to go right, and I'm always surprised when it doesn't. For example, yesterday I sent Rex to the store to get some barge glue. I had hardly any, I was going to say zero expectation. I had hardly any expectation at all that he would be able to find it. So Rex called from the first store. They don't have it. Called from the second store. They don't have it. Told me he was going to this other place. I wasn't upset, although I needed this stuff. It's crucial to get this stuff. I need this stuff in order to do something that I have to do. So it's like, okay, well, why am I not upset? Well, because I considered second force. I calculated second force when I sent Rex out. And why we always expect everything to go right is because we forget all about second force. We forget all about it. Why is it we always forget about second force? We never remember second force. Why is that? And these are the things... It's not even that. It's not even thinking. See, it's, it's just not even thinking at all. It's just being entirely mechanical. We just imagine that it's all going to happen the way we want it to happen. We don't, we don't have to do anything. We don't have to calculate anything. We don't have to take in any other forces. I want this. I want this to be this way. And we're used to getting what we want, even if it's only in our imagination, which satisfies every center. So when we don't get what we want, we throw fits. We go crazy. We get negative, which is the work term for insanity. Getting negative over something you have no control over. How stupid is that? Well, it's not stupid, it's insane. Which is, of course, my point. Interesting how we come back full circle on that. Only eyes in the work remember such things. Second force. Only eyes in the work remember. It's not going to happen the way you think it's going to happen. It's not going to happen the way you want it to happen. If it does, it will happen. It won't be because you did it. It'll just be because that's what happened this time. And next time, something entirely different may happen. Or, more surprising, next time the exact same thing may happen. That would be shocking. Doesn't happen two times the same way. Look at nature. Show me a straight line in nature. Why are there no straight lines in nature? The law of seven. There are no straight lines in nature because of the law of seven. We make straight lines. We impose our will on something and we make straight lines. So the work guys, they're remembering the things like second force. They're remembering the things like everything just happens. They remember that. But the ordinary eyes where we live, the little mechanical eyes where we live, where we spend all of our time, they've never even heard of those ideas. Does that seem strange to you? Doesn't seem strange to you that there are eyes that have never even heard this system, don't know who I am, don't know what this system is, don't know what the fourth way is? Some, yes, what? Can't decide? No. Okay, so for some it seems strange and for some it does not seem strange. If it sounds strange, it's because we're taking ourselves as one. And there are times when it sounds strange and there are times when it doesn't sound strange. Because there are times when we're taking ourselves as one and times when we're not taking ourselves as one. So here, you should be on your best behavior. You should have all your work eyes mustered and standing at attention and ready for inspection. 
And when I say present arms, they should all be right there. And they've got the work right here. Here's the work. We're ready. We're ready to go. Is that the case? No, not always. It may be the case this morning because there's a little more edge to things this morning than there usually is. The frivolity isn't there that is usually there. Our ordinary, frivolous kind of happy meetings. Oh, something's wrong this morning. What's wrong this morning? Something's wrong this morning. Something's different. I don't think anything's wrong. But you can choose whatever you'd like. To remember oneself is to realize emotionally one's mechanicalness. To be identified is to be asleep. What could be more simple? If you're identified with every eye, you're asleep. If you're beginning to emotionally realize your mechanicalness, you're waking up. Moments of self-remembering come when we emotionally realize work ideas like everything just happens. You taste that you're not in your usual identified state. Everything doesn't just happen. <laughs> That's how we think. We think, no, everything doesn't just happen. It's up to me to make it happen. It's up to me to fix it. It's up to me to change it. It's not going to get done unless I do it. Who else is going to do it? I'm the man, right? I'm the guy who's got to make this happen. This is what people pay me for. This is what they depend on. When they call me on the phone, they expect me to get the job done. Is this not you? Mm -hmm. So then when it doesn't happen, what happens? We get negative. Good, I thought I was talking to you guys, but I wasn't sure by the looks on your faces there for a minute. As we are, we're made negative by most ordinary events. It takes so little to make us negative. I can make anybody here negative in two minutes. That is not the way this is supposed to work. You need to be on your toes around me. You need to have the work between you and me so that nothing I say can make you negative. Nothing. If you can't practice it here, where are you going to practice it? Where it's easier? Where's it going to be easier than here? Where can it possibly be easier than with your teacher? This is the place where you say, look, this is the one person in life who is never going to make me negative, ever. Now, that's your experience, right? That's because you do not have the work between us. You have something else between us. And what is that? It's your right to yourself, is what it is. It's going to boil down to your right to yourself. That's what it's going to boil down to, whatever you want to call it. Yes, it's going to be old associations, which means you're right to yourself. Yes, it's going to be internal considering, which means you're right to yourself. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's all going to boil down to one thing, your right to yourself. You are not willing to give it up. Okay, so then you got it. You get to stay who you are. So you came here to change. You came here to be different. You came here to change your thoughts. You came here to change your feelings. You came here to change the direction of your life. And what do you decide to do? Well, I'm not going to do that. I have a right to have things the way they are. Yes, you have. And you've got them just the way they are. Give yourself a big round of applause because you have done it. It's the one thing you've been able to do. You've been able to stay mechanical, stay the same, stay asleep. The telephone pole there can do that. But that's okay. We ascribe this great massive will to our ability to be like the telephone pole. That's what's amazing to me. It's like, oh, look at me. I've stayed mechanical. Do you have any idea what an effort that's been? Oh, yes, I have an idea. It's been a huge effort. You've had to do nothing. You've had to be negative. You've had to internally consider. You had to justify, self-justify. You had to do all those things. A huge effort. Huge expenditure of force. For what? To get nowhere, to change absolutely nothing, to stay the same. Okay, we're asleep. Ordinary events make us negative. The opposite of that is self-remembering. No rocket science here. The opposite of your ordinary state is self-remembering. You know what your ordinary state is. Find what isn't. Oh, well, that's like finding a needle in a haystack, though, isn't it? Because we spend so much time in our ordinary state. But we imagine that we don't. But when your ordinary state is shown for what it is, everything makes us negative. Well, everything doesn't make me negative. See, you're already negative. Never make an aim that's not connected with the work. But I have to eat. I have to go to work. I have to survive. Never make an aim that's not connected with the work. Well, I got to make money in order to pay the bills. Never make an aim that's not connected with the work. Well, then how can I make money and pay the bills? Never make an aim that's not connected with the work. Okay, so let's say you're really clever at making money. So then you make a aim to make a certain amount of money. Does anybody have an aim to make a certain amount of money? So it's a life aim. Yes. Did I say never make an aim that's not connected with the work? Yes, you did. But that's a life aim. So you've got an aim that's not connected with the work. Here we are, two seconds into this, and already, well, I'm not doing that. He doesn't know what he's talking about here. I'm not doing that. Fine for him, but what happens if I stop giving him money? <laughs> they don't change his mind. Will he? So here's what you do. You make some form of the work possible with the money that you make. So you make an aim to make a certain amount of money, whatever that is. I don't care what it is. Double it for all I care. Triple it. I don't care. Now, make an aim to make some part of the work possible, some form of the work possible with part of that money. What does that mean? What does the work need? 
It needs to move forward on two legs, and it can't do it anything theoretically or philosophically. It has to be practically. So what does it need? What does the work need? What will a school? That's right. And so what does that mean? What can you do? What's your third line of work? What can you do to make that happen? You need to be thinking about this, people. We need a place to meet. What can you do to make that happen? Now, you see, you've taken your life aim and you've mingled it with a work aim, and now you can effectively go out and earn that money. You can take those eyes that would only scramble like rats for themselves, and you now begin to train them to do something bigger, to train them to be more useful in a bigger, higher way. That's what this work is about, people. This work is about that. It's about training the little mechanical eyes to be useful because that's all we've got right now. This apparent life aim will connect with the work. Self-remembering must connect with something higher than life and its aims. You're never going to remember yourself out there with life aims. I'll guarantee it. It's just not going to happen. As a matter of fact, what will happen is life aims will drag you out of the work. They will drag you down and out. There's not one person who's ever left the work who didn't leave through life aims. Not one. Life aims is always the door out. Work aims is always the door out of life. Life aims is always the door out of the work. Very simple. Simple choice. But you got to be conscious to make that simple choice. And we're rarely conscious. We're rarely even a little bit awake. An aim should have three forces. There are three lines of work. What does the work need? Gurdjieff said, man must insulate himself from life in order to work. You can't work exposed to every change of external circumstances. If you are exposed to every change in external circumstances, you cannot work. You must be insulated from that. There's a war going on. There are fires in California. The price of fuel is so high, I can't survive. So, like I told Rex the other day, look, Rex, so you live in a refrigerator box, you lose the ranch, you lose all your trucks, you lose your business, you lose everything. Can they take away your meditation practice? No. Can that take away the work? No. So you sit in a refrigerator box and you practice the pashana and you practice this work. What have you lost? Nothing. You've gained everything. And you've got to be willing to go there because that is where you're going. You're not taking any of this with you. You're not even taking the body with you. When you move on, you're going without all this stuff. May as well get used to letting it go now. Do it willingly. Do it consciously. A Sufi teacher once said, safety lies in solitude. Think about your life. Where does safety lie for you? Are you safe with people? No. So does safety lie in solitude? Yes. All I ask is that you think, just a little bit. I'm not asking that you think a lot, just a little. Just apply some thought to this. Safety lies in solitude, he said. Then he also said, let none imagine solitude consists in living alone. Now, just when I thought I had it the way I wanted it. If you like me one moment and dislike me the next moment, are you not asleep? When we're aware of this and we don't act on either, like or dislike, we're insulated from life. When you're aware that you like me one moment and don't like me the next, when you're aware of that, yeah, I like them sometimes, I don't like them. But you don't act on either one. Oh, I really like them. Oh, Paz, it's so good to see you. Oh, you SOP, I hate you. Yeah. When you don't act on either one, that's being insulated from life. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about having the work between us and life. There is nothing else here except life. This is life. This is life for you. Me standing here and doing this, this is life. This is your life. Yeah, you got a lot of other life too, but this is a little microcosm of your life. This is like a drop of dew on a rose petal that you go look at and you can see all of the environment around it, right there reflected in that little drop of dew. This is it. This is it. This is a perfect place for you to experiment and live your life. I spend a lot of time and effort and energy and thought to create this space for you to live your life in, for you to experiment in. Take advantage of it. Insulate yourself from life. It's not indifference. It's becoming conscious. Indifference is mechanical. Keeping between opposites is conscious balance. Indifference is a mechanical reaction. Staying between the opposites is conscious balance. That's what we're aiming for. In order to do that, we've got to keep the work right in front of us. But as it is right now, we have false personality in front of us. Exchange that and put the work in front of us and false personality behind us. One could say many things, but does not. Let's take, for example, you go to court and the judge is a jerk. And in life, you would go, what a jerk, and stand up and walk out. But in court, you don't. Why is that? He's got more power. He has the authority to put you in jail. You can say contempt of court. 
and somebody with a gun comes over and goes to take you away. And if you resist him, then he gets on his radio and he calls a lot of other somebodies with guns and they come and take you away. And if you resist all of them, then they call a lot of others with guns. And they come in and they spray something in your face and they hit you with a baton or they do this. But eventually what they do is they handcuff you and they drag you away. And then they put you in a little cell. And that's what happens. And you know that's what happens. So you keep your big flapping mouth shut, don't you? So it is possible to be silent. It is possible to shut up. But you will only do it under those kinds of extreme circumstances. Now, I've seen people under those very kinds of extreme circumstances still too stupid to keep their mouth shut. It's a mystery to me how that happens, but it does. So this is external silence, isn't it? Now you get to court, you keep your mouth shut. External silence. Traffic cop stops you and he's going to give you a ticket. And every time you open your mouth, he adds another ticket. Well, you learn to keep your mouth shut, don't you? You learn to observe external silence. Okay, that's external silence. And in the work, they say you need to observe external silence, but it's not for that reason. Not allowing those eyes to talk, not going with them, not believing in them by inner choice is still keeping external silence, but it's doing it in a much deeper way. Can you see the difference? Yes. That's what this work is about. Inner stop means stopping thinking in a certain way, not the external mores that govern what we say, but an inner choice that comes from consciousness that comes from a higher level of being, that comes from an awareness of the work, that comes from self-remembering. That is what we're talking about.